Hi, all. Um, good afternoon. I'm Elsa Connect, and I am the Deputy Director of Public Policy for the National Center for Victims of Crime. And I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Solving Property Crimes with Forensic DNA. And I want to just uh, go through um, a couple of housekeeping issues before we get started. Um, you can hear me now, you, you can ignore this slide, but this is for those who are having trouble with uh, getting audio today. So I'm just gonna sit on the slide for a minute just so those folks can um, turn on or adjust their speakers. Um, and of course they can't hear me anyway, so I'll go ahead and move on. If you are having any technical issues during the webinar, uh, please call WebEx support directly at 866-229-3239. Just a note that all of the participants on this webinar are muted upon entry. So that means that you will not be able to ask a question verbally, but you will be able to ask a question using the question and answer tool in WebEx. I'm gonna switch participants to the full screen view now to show you how your screen will look during the presentation and how to find the question and answer tool. Okay, so you are in the full screen view now. If you look at the little floating toolbar on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, if you see the little question mark icon there, if you click that, that will open the question and answer panel. Um, that will bring up the panel and you can uh, type in your question there and send submit. That will send the question to just the panelists. All of the attendees cannot see uh, your questions. And you can also see the uh, panel in the question answer panel in the split screen view as well. You may have to maximize it to see it, but it's also on the right hand corner of your screen. We are going to do our best to answer all questions today at the end of the presentation, but if we don't get to your question today, we, we do have a very full webinar today um, our with our present presenters, um, but we'll follow you up with you by email if we don't get to uh, your question today. But please do feel free to submit questions. We encourage you to do so. And as you logged in, you may have noticed that there is a poll on the right side of your screen. We hope that everyone got a chance to complete the poll so far, but if you didn't, uh, if you do so now, we'll close that poll in just a few minutes. And this just helps gauge um, how effective our trainings are, so we appreciate you taking the time to um, answer the poll for us. And don't forget to hit submit because that will send your answers in to us. I want to just note that some of the questions are opinion questions, so there is not a right answer. Mainly, we're just asking some of these questions to get a, a sense of um, what folks in the field are thinking about some of these issues. We are very pleased to bring you this webinar today with the support of Applied Biosystems. They are a DNA technology company uh, working with us to increase knowledge of how DNA technology can be used to assist criminal investigations. And this is the second webinar in our series of six with them. More information is available on our website, but I do want to note that um, on January 14th, we have Mitch Morrissey again with the prosecutor's perspective on innovative uses of DNA, and Detective Belozis will join us again on February 25th for recovering DNA evidence from crime scenes. And I'll give you, um, the website is right here. You can find some more information on our website, and we'll give you that again at the end of the presentation. And now I just want to tell you a little bit about the National Center before I turn over the webinar to our presenters. The National Center's mission is to forge a national commitment to help victims of crime rebuild their lives. And we do this through direct support to all victims of crime uh, via our National Crime Victim Helpline, 1-800-FYI-CALL. We provide training and technical assistance to those who work with victims, and we work with Congress to secure rights and resources and protections for victims, um, and also uh, funding for victim services. We work a lot on securing burn money and VOCA fund money. Uh, since about 2002, the National Center has been focusing on increasing understanding of forensic DNA and DNA technology, because we do believe that, of course, we can solve more cases and prevent more crime by maximizing DNA technology. And of course, this is good for victims and uh, for our communities in general. So we have been and we will continue to hold in-person trainings. You can look for those in the spring and fall of next year. We created a listserv for those who are interested in DNA-related issues and developed materials about forensic DNA for 
victims and for victim serving professionals. We have one um, brochure that is specifically about working with victims in cold cases, and that one is geared towards a law enforcement audience. So this um, is the web address here for our online DNA Resource Center website, and all the materials I mentioned, um, information about our trainings, and our, all of our webinar information is available um, on this website. And this is my contact information. Um, please feel free to contact me with any questions or um, if you want to join our DNA-related listserv. Um, I do provide some technical assistance um, related to DNA. And um, I'd also like it if you wanted to let me know about any innovative work you're doing in your community around DNA. And we're going to close the poll now. It looks like a lot of answers have been coming in, but we're going to go ahead and, and close that poll and hear from today's uh, speakers. I'm going to wait one second because it looks like a lot of you are trying to get your answers in right now. Okay, there we go. Okay, our first speaker today is Detective Sergeant Joseph Blosis. He retired last year from the New York Police Department where he worked for almost 30 years, 13 of those years as a senior sergeant in the crime scene unit where he managed more than 2,500 crime scenes including more than 1,000 homicide investigations. In 1993 and 2001, he oversaw both crime scene investigations involving the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center Prior positions include working in a detective squad, as plainclothes anti-crime, and as a uniformed patrol officer. Before his retirement, Detective Sergeant Blosis coordinated the New York PD's Biotrax DNA program, which he will discuss today. Okay, and thank you very much for being with us, Joe. I'm going to hand over controls to Joe, and he'll take it from here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to start off by thanking the National Center for the Victims of uh, Crime for inviting me and uh, giving me this privilege to uh, address such a, a prestigious group uh, as, you, as we have attending here today. I'm very impressed about the uh, registrars uh, throughout the country, and uh, I do appreciate everyone taking their time out from their busy schedules. As Elsie told you, I was recently retired. I'm a retired detective sergeant from the NYPD. My expertise, my love of my life is crime scene investigations. Uh, through my tenure in the crime scene unit, um, I learned very different aspects of, uh, of forensic disciplines. One in particular is DNA. In the last two years of my career, we decided that we wanted to utilize DNA not only for high-profile crimes, but for, um, but for property crimes as well. And we developed a program called the Biotrax program, which I'd like to discuss with you now. Oops. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry about the delay. The program that I'd like to discuss with everyone is uh, obviously is the Biotrax program. And what that is, is before I actually get into the program, I'd just like to go over some basic concepts of uh, DNA and, what it, and what's it all about. DNA is an organic compound found in the chromosomes of the nuclei of cells. It is the carrier of our genetic information. Basically, what this is telling us is, this is uh, it, it makes us who we are. It makes us being six foot four, brown hair, weighing 220 pounds to basically having different uh, genetic uh, composition within our cells. However, the analysts at the DNA labs, what we're using to download the profiles in CODIS is uh, nothing that can determine your eyes, your skins, their hair colors, or your predisposing health risks. Uh, what they're looking at is uh, basically 13 loci or markers. There are a bunch of numbers, and with these numbers, you can identify a person. Again, with the junk DNA, you cannot tell a, a uh, predisposition, health issue, or eyes, skin colors, and so forth. What is Biotrax? Bottom line to this is we couldn't have did it without the help of um, the President's DNA Initiative Program. Through uh, NIJ, the National Institute of Just, uh, Justice, we were able to get a pilot grant money 
given from NIJ to the Division of Criminal Justice Services here in New York to look at no suspect burglary cases. We wanted to use the technology of DNA and a database in order to identify recidivists, ultimately to reduce crime. We had to collect biological uh, evidence left at scenes by intruders, and we wanted to have those uh, evidence left generate SDR profiles and upload these profiles into the CODIS system. In our pilot project, we, uh, we did use uh, biological evidence. It was a huge success. And then, as I will get on to uh, later on in the uh, presentation, we um, expanded from biological to also include touch DNA evidence. We wanted to demonstrate the, that burglary scenes have potential DNA ev evidence. We wanted to solve these no suspect burglaries. We wanted to establish links between, between different cases, between different burglary scenes. And we wanted to reduce the rate of burglaries and ultimately uh, reduce uh, more serious crimes. This is an example of one case that uh, we were involved with. And basically, this case involved elderly um, senior citizens. And elderly, I mean 100 and years plus years young, as I would like to call it. And bottom line is the, the woman that you're seeing on the, uh, the left-hand uh, photo was a woman that was um, uh, exiting her elevator, and she was accosted by the individual uh, to her right. And this individual here, and I'm being kind with those words, ended up beating her. She exited that elevator utilizing a walker. She was on her way to the grocery store. He pummeled her, causing serious injuries to her head, and he ended up stealing approximately 35 to $75 from her pocketbook that she was using to go on her way to the grocery store. It ended up, we knew that he was developing a pattern, and he ended up doing the same thing to the woman that's all the way to the far right. He preyed on the elderly. The common denominator to this entire case is, as you can see, he had an extensive rap sheet, but he was a burglar. He was locked up on criminal trespass. He was locked up on burglaries prior. And also during the, this investigation from start to finish, we were also a, able to identify him in the Biotrax pro, uh, program as burglarizing a, her, uh, a house of worship. Back in uh, January of last year, almost a year to come next month, uh, the trials, uh, well, the hearings uh, actually uh, began. And during uh, the hearing, it was uh, an unfortunate incident, but the uh, victim, the elderly, was asked to identify the uh, suspect inside the courtroom. And due to her age and poor vision, she couldn't really pick him out in the uh, courtroom. Matter of fact, she picked out a, uh, a journalist that was seated in the, uh, in, in the uh, courtroom. However, uh, she asked the, uh, the judge back then, she asked the judge, if you could please have the, uh, have the individual seating at the defense uh, table basically smile. And he smiled, she smiled, and she recognized his, uh, his teeth. He had some gold caps back then, and she was able to identify him uh, through his uh, teeth. I'm happy to say that recently, as of uh, last week, uh, the trial was, uh, uh, went on, and he was found guilty in numerous counts of robberies against the elderly. Uh, the judge in this particular case was a personal friend of mine, Judge Greg Lasak. And bottom line is uh, he sentenced him, well, I should even say before he was uh, uh, sentenced, he, uh, he asked for mercy of the court, saying that he's a relatively young man and that he can't do uh, 20 years in jail. G uh, Judge L uh, Greg Lasak replied to him, uh, uh, the act that you did was beyond um, belief, and basically what I'm going to do to you is I'm going to give you a one-year sentence for every dollar that you stole. And in this case, he stole $75 from the elderly, and he was sentenced to $75, uh, 75 years in prison. Why burglaries? Burglaries have a 70% rearrest rate. The first 1,000 hits in New York State, 80% of the offenders were in the database for a lesser crime. The New York State database currently holds a pro well over 330,000 DNA profiles, 28,000 forensic samples. Submitting DNA evidence from burglary should yield a large number of hits to these recidivists. 
this is an updated statistical data of our uh, of our uh, New York State database. As far as again the DNA profiles, our forensic samples, the total number of offender and forensic kits, uh, almost 8,000. Number of forensic case to case hits, 222. Number of national hits through the endis uh, portion of the CODIS database, over 1,300. These stats are effective as of uh, August 15th, and they're uh, updated uh, every few uh, every few months on the uh, on the web. The bottom line to this is, with the CODIS database, our main concern is the convicted offender database. Bottom line is, we proved here that burglaries were the common denominators for persons graduating to a higher crime. In our pilot project, we had to come up with a section of New York City that we wanted to take $150,000 that was given through us through the DNA initiative program, that NIJ grant. And bottom line is with this $180,000 over a 10 month period, we decided to focus in on a borough of Queens, in Queens North in particular. We looked at over 4,200 burglaries. That was what was reported in this 10 month period. 4,100 uh, burglaries we actually responded to, 3,100 scenes were processed, and in 227 scenes, we actually processed those scenes for DNA. Establishing a team, very, very important. Everybody must be on board in order to make this program work. One, obviously, you have to have your evidence collection teams. Whether they may be your first responders, and I know first responders in different municipalities across the states, they wear a number of different hats. You're not only the um, uh, the report taker, you're on patrol, but you're also taking uh, the reports for the burglaries, and many times you're processing those scenes for uh, fingerprints and DNA and so forth and so on. But bottom line is evidence collection teams must be on board with the proper training. You must have proper personnel in your crime laboratories. You, if it goes out for a grant where your lab cannot handle the volume of cases that are coming in, again, I, I, def I, I Im definitely would uh, encourage your supervisors to actually put in for these grants. There is tons of money that is available, once again, from the DNA Initiative Program that is there to help you as long as you uh, put in the proper paperwork for it. So if you need to use private vendors, in our case, we use Bodhi Technology. Uh, we had our Office of Medical Examiner's Office. They have to a uh, very important role in this whole program. They have to do the technical reviews to make sure that the uh, that the uh, analysis was done correctly and meets the requirements prior to upload to the CODIS. We wanted to make sure our detective squads were on board. We had proper training with the detective squads, and we had proper meetings with our district attorneys to make sure that they were on board. We wanted to make sure that these burglars were getting, uh, being fully prosecuted to the fullest extent of the, of the law, and not just been uh, given a slap on the wrist type of um, type of sentences. So each uh, borough in the city of New York, we have five district attorneys. Uh, our district attorneys um, uh, ended up um, having liaisons assigned to their uh, respective uh, uh, offices, and their liaisons office worked hand-in-hand -hand with our Biotrax team. How our Biotrax teams work, bottom line is, once again, we had our evidence collection teams collecting the DNA evidence, the biological, the touch evidence out in the scenes. They would submit all that evidence to the NYPD laboratory, where myself and a very small staff, we would review that casework that was coming in. We wanted to make sure that the evidence was probative, which I'll get into in a few moments. Once we find that this evidence would be probative, and probative I mean giving the investigator probable cause to make an arrest, would this evidence give that detective probable cause to make an arrest? to solve this crime, then we would forward it to our, uh, our, our vendors. Back then, we were utilizing Orchid Cellmark and Bodhi. Uh, Orchid Cellmark uh, dropped out of the game, and at the end, we only used Bodhi. And once again, those case files for the technical reviews would go to the OCME's office. They would upload it into the CODA system for a match, and we would subsequently be notified of the match. In our case management, case review was imperative. Probative versus non-probative evidence. I just basically stated to you, real quickly once again, does this evidence give probable cause to make an arrest? If it does, we want it. If it doesn't, 
That doesn't mean we don't want to collect it at the scene, but basically what? We can collect it and have it stored. Bottom line is if it, uh, if it deems itself relevant to the case, then we can always have it examined at a further date. Clothing is processed for hairs that are suitable for nuclear DNA. With clothing, we always look at clothing for the epithelial cells that are on that clothing. However, hairs, hairs play a pivotal role as well. Um, hairs uh, should be examined to see if they are suitable for nuclear DNA. Hairs are time-consuming and could be rather co uh, costly. So therefore, if the clothing came back negative and we did have hair suitable for nuclear DNA, we would then submit the hair and have that analyzed. In our DNA samples, you must have elimination samples just as you would if you had fingerprints. Abandoned samples we would be collected from a, uh, well, abandoned and pseudo exemplar uh, for time's sake is basically one and the same. If you had a suspect and you did a check and you found out that this suspect's DNA was not in the CODIS database, bottom line is it is legal in the state of New York and in many states across the United States to have an abandoned sample of his taken and submitted in the local database for comparison. Maybe you can have him smoke a cigarette. Maybe you can have him drink for a uh, container. Uh, there were numerous cases when during a uh, walkout of a perp being arrested on one particular rape charge, he would spit at a reporter on the scene. The detectives are trained to pick up that saliva and we would submit it as abandoned property. Pseudo exemplars, you may think that it's uh, Joe Blosis may have uh, committed the act. However, Joe is not in the database. You may follow Joe to a uh, tavern. He may have a, uh, a Coors Light. You may end up taking that bottle and submitting it. Forensic samples, obviously what you, what you collected from the scene. We're going to upload these into the do local database, upload into the CODIS and let eligible profiles to identify state and, natural matches and national matches, notify the MP NYPD of these matches. ACTs collected, we collected over 3,400 scenes involving over 64 items, 6,400 items rather, excuse me. The types and number of items submitted, and uh, we had over 2,200 2, items of contact down to beverage containers, hairs, cigarette butts, items with the highest percentage yield, no brainer here. Blood evidence at the scene is a home run. Cigarette butts, 80%, 6%. 86% of the time, giving the lab a cigarette butt will give you the name of, of an offender. Down to latex gloves, outer clothing, knit gloves, accessory wear, doors, rubber gloves, tools, and windows. Preliminary results, 2,200 profiles from 6,391 items. 24% of the items yielded a profile. 1,500 CODIS-eligible profiles. 45% of the cases yielded a CODIS-eligible profile. I must say that these stats are, are flawed in that once I retired in April of 08 last year, these stats came to a screeching halt. So there's no updated stats, but these were good as of April of, of 2008. My prime uh, proudest stat is 692 case to offender matches to 548 offenders within three years. That's 548 offenders that would have never have been identified through the use of fingerprints or any other means, just with through DNA. Out of those known offenders, we had two offenders to seven offenses. We had 17 matching three offenses. This is linking crime scenes to crime scenes. We had 10 offenders, five teams, two offenders. Each team committed one offense. One particular example of this, Robert Medina, five burglaries within seven days. We estimated that he's doing over 300 burglaries, a professional burglar, 300 burglaries per month. We got his DNA off of a scarf, blood, knife, another a hair from a scarf, and he left his sneakers at a particular scene, and we and we able to get DNA from the sneakers. Out of the 548 case to offend that matches, 468 came out of CODIS Estes. That's the state database. That's your convicted offenders in your in your uh, respective states. The detectives. We verify that they're probative evidence. We want to establish that there was probable cause, that this evidence was found inside the crime scene. It's eliminated from the, the, the possession of the complainant or a witness or a resident or whatever. We confer with the crime scene personnel who collected the evidence. We also provided a photo to the complainant. Why is this? Not for a show up, not for a lineup. What we wanted to make sure is, is that this person that was identified through the DNA match is not a relative, is not a friend is not known to the complainant, and then we usually would just turn around and say, this is the person that violated your residence. We follow it up by sending out corresponding communications to the squads to make sure that they're on board and that they are going out and making these arrests. 
squads, we get paid to make arrests. We will arrest. We wanted the DAs to prosecute. Out of the 500 total offenses, 273 offenders were arrested as a Biotrax arrest. Out of 183 in Queens County, 70 pled, uh, pled guilty. It's a no-brainer. It's very similar to, uh, to fingerprints, very hard to, de uh, to defeat in court. The ones that try to bring it to trial are recidivists. They, uh, they have extensive rap sheets, and, and, and a burglary is going to subsequently put them away for a long period of time. Such an example is this guy had nothing to lose as being a predicate felon, a recidivist. He ended up getting 20 years to life for his burglary on top of all his others. Out of the career criminals, the first 35 into the program out of the pilot shows that these are bad people. 54% were had over 25, 54% had over 25 arrests. 89% were arrested for violent felonies. Prior convictions, 80% were convicted for violent felonies. The Urban Institute report in April of 2008, another NIJ funded pro program. It went out to five communities. Orange County, Los Angeles, Topeka, Phoenix, and Denver, which Mitch Morrissey is going to be following me in about two minutes to tell you about the successful Denver program. Each site collected biological evidence from 500 uh, property crimes. The highlights of this uh, institute's um, program was suspects were five times as likely to be identified through DNA evidence as through fingerprints. Burglary DNA evidence resulted in twice as many suspects identified, arrested, and prosecuted. Evidence collected by forensic technicians was no more likely to result in a suspect being identified than evidence collected by patrol officers. Blood more effective than any other biological evidence. Suspects identified by DNA had at least twice as many prior felony arrests and convictions as those identified through traditional investigations involving burglary. In 2006, there were, there were 2 million, over 183,000 burglaries reported to police. Approximately half of the burglaries go unreported. 20% were, were solved. Suspects identified through DNA had an average of 5.6 prior felony arrests compared to 1.7 felony arrests through traditional, uh, traditional investigative means. There were 2.9 uh, felony, uh, prior felony convictions compared to 0.9 through traditional investigative means. Problems, it ended up, if everybody was to get on board with this, is you must be cognizant of that all Aristes and CODIS is going to put a drain on everyone's systems. Your laboratories, your backlogs, the volumes of cases, your police resources. Many municipalities may only have one detective working on a homicide, let alone now he has to go and lock up burglars. Prosecutors, not enough prosecutors, public defenders to go around. Correctional facilities, where are we going to put these people? Burglary scenes are an excellent source for DNA results. Biotrax is a means to solve lesser offense cases. They have the potential to reduce crime and recidivism. Biotrax is a strategy to apprehend criminals before they graduate to violent crimes. And in closing, I'd just like to make a few acknowledgments here, as you can see up on the screen. And before I close out, I'd just like to tell you about burglaries, once again, is definitely a stepping stone to more heavier crimes, as we, as we would call it. Uh, it is a great way to reduce uh, crimes within your communities. It is a great way to save lives, to stop these individuals, to get away from the crimes of opportunities before they end up raping and sometimes murdering uh, the victims and, vict and other victims in our uh, communities. With that, I'd like to close out. I'd like to say happy holidays to everybody, and by all means, please stay safe. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Joe. It's very impressive, the numbers and the program. And um, I just want to say to everyone, if you ever get a chance to see Joe in person, you should absolutely do it because he's extremely hilarious in person and <clears throat> doesn't come over as well on um, on the webinar. But it, he is a, a wonderful speaker, and we're really glad to have him. Um, we're going to move along quickly to Mitch Morrissey so we can have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, I just want to introduce Mitch. Uh, he is a district attorney in Denver, Colorado. He's internationally recognized for his expertise in DNA technology in criminal investigations. He introduced the first DNA evidence used in criminal trial in Denver and has worked extensively on the Denver Cold Case Project, where more than 4,200 unsolved sexual assaults and murders have been reviewed to solve them using DNA evidence. He is one of the leading proponents of using familial DNA database searches in the United States and directs the Denver DNA Human Identification Research Project, which is studying the use of familial DNA searches 
in criminal investigations in Colorado. Working with the Denver Police Department, he has implemented the use of DNA to solve burglary cases and other property crimes, and he is here today to talk about that program with us. So welcome, Mitch. Address. Oh. Oh, Are you there? there? I got you now. Can you hear yep. me? Sorry, we, okay. we missed a second. Yep. That's all right. Well, I just want to thank everybody to, for being part of this. One thing I do have to tell you, I cannot talk as fast as Joe. <laughs> Joe does a great job uh, presenting, but I just, I occasionally, I just can't, not being a New Yorker, I can't, just cannot speak as fast as he can. I want to thank the center for having me certainly an honor to address you all today. The one thing I did want to also touch on was that NIJ was also a partner in our program, and without their funding, we would not have been able to do this work. What we were trying to do, and really our work was kind of a follow-up to Joe's BioTrack work, and that was we, again, wanted to evaluate the effectiveness on burglaries. How many burglaries could we prevent? We wanted to evaluate the efficiency of using DNA in burglary investigations. We also wanted to set for our police department and my office the best practices when it came to trying to solve burglaries uh, with DNA. We were the really the only site of the five sites that were selected in the study that uh, Joe talked about that went all the way through conviction. So we were able to track the people that we got our hits on all the way through what happened to them in court. Uh, we were asked to try to come up with 500 cases. We came up with 510. Uh, half of those cases were put aside and not used as part of the DNA process. They were cases that were used for comparison. Of those, we filed 222 cases uh, with my office. There were 600 profiles that we uploaded into CODIS, resulting in 309 CODIS hits, which was an average rate of, of 51%. In the two-year period, and basically we ran this program, once we got started, we got the training, we ran this program first for 18 months, starting in 2005 and ending in the fall of 2007. During that period of time, we caught 95 habitual burglars who had been arrested, were arrested and prosecuted in the project. They were taken all the way through uh, conviction. 97 of those, we filed John Doe cases. And those were cases where we didn't have a match, we didn't have a hit in CODIS. So what we did to prevent the statute of limitations for running on those burglary or other property crimes, we have a three-year statute of limitations. To keep that from running, we went ahead and filed the case, uh, people of the state of Colorado versus John Doe, with the specific DNA profile that we obtained. Uh, during the course of that so far, 36 of those John Doe cases we have gotten a hit, and now we know the name of the individual, and we've converted those case filings into case filings on the individual. And th this is what I talked about as far as the John Doe statute of limitations. Uh, really what we wanted to do is take advantage of this half a million dollars that NIJ was offering to change the philosophy in our police department and in my office, the DA's office, regarding using DNA and property crimes. And what we did was an intensive training to show that uh, the DNA actually did help not only catch property offenders, but also reduce the crime rate in our city. And that's what we've seen. We wanted to, uh, the police conf are confronted with a lot of different changes, a lot of new ideas. Uh, we wanted to make sure this just wasn't a policy change, but was actually a procedural change. So it was an uh, intensive training that starts at our police academy. Uh, it involved my deputies going to all the roll call trainings for all the patrol officers. We did trainings for all the detectives and all the command about how we were planning to use DNA, the types of things they needed to be looking for to try, try to change the entire mindset of our entire police department. And what like Joe said, the team and the communication between the teams was extremely important. The uh, police districts, we have six of them in Denver. The crime lab, which we have our own crime lab in the Denver Police Department. And, of course, the deputy and deputies that were assigned in my office. This was the, uh, this was the key personnel that we had in the program. 
Uh, a lot of this had to do with startups, so if you're going to do a startup, you may need these individuals. But once you get going, I think you'll find that the critical piece is once your deputies know how to handle these cases, once your detectives and patrol officers know what they're looking for and the impact that it has in the area where they work, uh, the crime scene investigators, uh, the critical piece for us after the money uh, ran out was to make sure that we had dedicated DNA analysts in our crime lab to run these profiles in a timely fashion so the detectives could get the answers that they needed, we could get the CODIS hits, and have the impact of taking these burglars out of our neighborhoods. We were uh, trying to get the best bang for the buck that we had. We were primarily interested in blood and saliva, uh, and we reduced the burglary rate, the home burglary rate, in our city by 26% during the course of the 18-month study. Uh, you can see that we were, a uh, lot like Joe, uh, we were able to get 14-year sentence on average. Most of these guys were habitual criminals. Uh, traditionally investigated burglaries, we were getting about a year and a half. Uh, we were able to get these lengthy sentences because of a change, like the change Joe talked about, in my office, I told my deputies if they had a case where they had DNA or fingerprints uh, that an habitual criminal uh, that they needed to plead to the charge or we would need to go to trial. The interesting thing is I thought a lot of my deputies would get experience trying these DNA cases. That experience would be good and they could use it then on murders and sex assaults that we also have DNA evidence. The problem that we found is these guys don't go to trial. Uh, their average appearance time is they show up, they waive our pro a probable cause finding, they go to the district court, and they plead guilty. Sometimes they get sentenced that day. Sometimes there's a third setting. So what is normally a year and a half to a two-year process gets reduced to about a month in that these guys don't go to trial, they plead guilty to the principal charge, and they get sentenced to the penitentiary at about ten times what they would if we solved it through conventional means. A lot of that has to do with the makeup of our database because if you are a property offender in Colorado to get into the penitentiary and they didn't take DNA from anybody that went to the penitentiary, that didn't go to the penitentiary, even convicted felons before 2007, you pretty much had to be an habitual criminal to be in our DNA database as a property offender. We were eight times more likely to be able to prosecute a case where we had a DNA profile and had a CODIS match. Uh, and we, we, we figured the savings that we got, and if you look at the different papers, you can see that uh, there were differing amounts here. But conservatively, over the two-year period, we believe that using DNA, uh, we saved $25.6 million in property loss to uh, the residents in our community and we freed up every police officer in the Denver Police Department uh, 150 hours of their time to work on other cases. And again, this, this changed a little bit over time, but conservatively, we felt that for every dollar the National Institute of Justice gave us, the statistics showed a return of $63. If you look at a couple of our papers that are online, it gets up to $90 for every dollar that uh, they gave us. These are just some of the individuals that we uh, caught with DNA, if they left a, pop, a lollipop stick, if they uh, urinated, if uh, they had left blood. Mr. Davis, who's in the middle, uh, also shows one of the most important things that we found. With good detectives, if you give them the name of somebody that's working in their area through a CODIS hit, uh, we found that we solved a lot of non-DNA burglary cases as well. So Mr. Davis had been pawning items. He'd come to us from Missouri. He was a 13-time convicted burglar, came to Denver, uh, and we were able to catch him on five DNA burglaries and seven non-DNA burglaries. He went to trial and received a 48-year sentence in the penitentiary. Uh, I think Joe points out that many times these burglaries do lead to violent crimes. In one of Mr. Davis's situations, the homeowner hit him in the head with a wrench uh, causing him to bleed, and that was the source of our DNA. He did get away, but he left his blood at the crime scene. Uh, these are just some of the other individuals. 
Uh, we were able to, if they drank soda, if uh, we usually had to find the DNA inside the house. If you look at Mr. Wright in the middle, we found his DNA outside the home, but it was a combination of his DNA on a soda can as well as pawn ticket items from things taken inside the house. We we're able to go ahead and solve that case. Uh, Mr. Investor, Ivester there on this slide was interesting. Hungry burglar took a bite out of a tuna fish sandwich, didn't like it, spit it back onto the plate, returned the plate to the refrigerator. That resulted in enough saliva on the uh, tuna fish that he was chewing to get us a full DNA profile. and We were able to bring charges and get him convicted. Uh, we used it on commercial burglaries as well, and we have since expanded uh, the use of DNA where we find blood in auto thefts and car break-ins and other property crimes. Uh, this was a couple that we found on the same cigarette butt, and we did have the same kind of, uh, of success that Joe talked about. When we had blood, uh, we were able to get a DNA, a CODIS quality profile in about 94% of the samples. If we had saliva, it was 80% of the time, and the other types of biological samples we looked at, it was about 60% of the time. The Wellers, uh, we found one cigarette butt, which had both their profile on it. They were a team of professional burglars. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Weller testified in Mrs. Weller's trial, and on the witness stand admitted that he had pulled over a thousand burglaries in the neighborhood he was working in since the last time he had paroled uh, on a burglary conviction that he had. Um, and uh, when we took this couple off, we were able to reduce the burglary rate in the neighborhood where they were working, which is a pretty much one of the old established residential neighborhoods in Denver. We reduced the burglary rate by 41% just by arresting these two individuals and keeping them from pulling burglaries in that neighborhood. Uh, when the funds ran out, and obviously if you're gonna use federal money, you need to have a plan after that to, do, to can kind of keep this type of program going. Uh, we were able to do that through showing these statistics to our city leaders and the people that fund my office and the police department. Uh, when the federal funds ran out, we were able to get two dedicated analysts and that's all we needed then to have their salaries paid. In 2008, we were again able to file 145 DNA-based property crime cases, prosecute another 53 habitual offenders, and again, we saw a reduction in our burglary rate, our home burglary rate of 11% in 2008. 2009, we filed, uh, again, 99 DNA-based property crimes, prosecuted another 56 habitual offenders, and reduced our burglary rate this year by 7%. Hopefully, we'll continue to do that. Uh, so in total, we filed uh, 566 DNA-based cases, and we have so far prosecuted 206 habitual criminals. Yesterday, I filed a case, uh, and this just shows you how our detectives and patrol officers paying attention to break into a, a workout section of an apartment house. Uh, they had a video that showed one of the burglars drinking a soda can. He threw the city soda can in the trash. The trash had been dumped, so it was the only item in the can. Collected the can, got a DNA profile off of it, got a CODIS hit, went back to the video. The man we have the CODIS hit is one of the two burglars. And we filed that case yesterday. And then I think the last slide is my contact information. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Mitch. Sorry, it took me a second to get myself unmuted. Um, we do have some questions, and we have, well, I have about 13 minutes or so, so why don't we go right to those. I got one uh, just right now when, when you were speaking, um, Mitch, I think was geared towards you. Um, so if you want to stay unmuted, was there any difference when results of DNA was based on YSTR results? Uh, we we didn't use YSTRs in this program. Everything we did was uh, was based on uh, just STR profiles. 
so we could upload them into CODIS. So we didn't use YSTRs. Unless, like Joe said, there was some reason to go back and run YSTRs on some additional evidence or not. But we didn't use YSTRs in these cases. Okay. Um, another one was about reluctance on the part of, um, possibly on the part of patrol officers and investigators um, about the program and um, any kinds of extra training. How did you approach sort of getting everybody on board and the extra training that they might need to do? And that could be uh, to both of you. Well, to Mitch, what we did was we went to every roll call training. Um, I, I do a training at the academy about this program. I also do a, pro, a training and an update with all the detectives in the Denver Police Department and the command. Uh, my deputy goes out to every roll call training and talks to them. And really when you talk to a patrol officer that works a particular precinct every single time they're on duty, and you can tell them the kind of impact they can have if they bother to listen to the victim, and even if they collect or don't collect, if they call the people to come and collect a soda can, uh, blood, um, you know, a lollipop stick, a cigarette butt. So we key we keyed on them listening to the victim about things that are different about their the burglary scene, and then making sure either they collected if it was something they could take, or they called the people from the crime lab to come and collect in order to have the kind of impact we had across the city, reducing their workload. Mitch, if I could just add to that, just from a, a, a police department perspective, and mine uh, personally, bottom line to this is we have a program which I know a, a lot of departments have, is called ComStat. Uh, we uh, made training mandatory, and we held uh, not only the police officers, detectives, but their supervisors as well accountable to the success of this program. Um, I know I, uh, real quickly, I showed you an example of a follow-up. Those follow-ups were mandatory. Every week to three weeks, they had to uh, send in uh, a checklist on exactly what the status of their case was, and we kept on top of each and every one of those cases. Okay, and actually, um, you may see that another poll opened on the side, um, so if you can go ahead and answer that poll while we are um, going through questions, that would be great. Um, let's see, I have a lot of questions here coming in quickly. Um, one is uh, about getting information on known grants to assist paying for DNA collection and processing, where I guess basically the best source to get information. Um, there is a DNA.gov, which is probably one of the best sources, but uh, Joe and Mitch, do you have any other suggestions? No, that, that's, that's uh, those solicitations that are made by NIJ are, are the ones that we go after. Okay. Um, here's another one. Is there a correlation between these burglary defendants and other types of criminal activity, especially violent crime? Joe, you want to go ahead? Um, Elsa, one more time on that. I, I, I heard the question. I, I just don't uh, understand it. As far as violent crime? It, it's the, the link between um, burglary defendants and... Um, other types of criminal activity, especially violent crime, and I think we talked about this a little bit before, but... Right, well, in both programs, and I won't speak for Mitch, but uh, right now I will. Um, in both programs, uh, again, we're looking at recidivists. Uh, there were many uh, criminals that were caught for their first offense, basically, but there were a ton of uh, repeat offenders in this, and that's who we were gearing up. We wanted to get, the, we wanted to get these offenders off the street before they commit more violent uh, violent crimes. And uh, in both programs, uh, I, we were hugely successful, and uh, the ultimate goal of both programs is to ultimately reduce crime. Okay. And this, this is Mitch. What, what we saw was that, obviously, we, we had occasions where a uh, person broke into a house, confronted a homeowner, and a violent, an act of violence, either by the homeowner or the, the criminal breaking in, and I, I showed you Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, that was a pretty good fight. I, that was a, an assault, and uh, our victim just happened to be armed and caused a little more damage to Mr. Davis. We consider burglary a violent crime in Colorado when you break into somebody's home. 
Uh, but we have seen an overall reduction in our crime rate since we've been doing this program. And for the first time in years, we have seen a reduction in our sexual assault rate. I can't attribute it to specifically to this program alone because we've been extremely active in using DNA to catch rapists in our cold case program. But I think the combination of the two, and of course they're both DNA based, has shown a reduction across the board for crime in our community. And anytime you're reducing home burglaries by the percentages that we're talking about, that, that's a huge reduction. The year before we started this program, we had an increase of 5% in our burglary rate in my city. Um, let's see. That I'm just they're coming in fast and furious here. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, and I have a little technical problem here, but I will get to the next one. Did you just swab the items and book the swab? Oh, sorry, you guys, but this is um, and book the swab and the item too. Blood found on a piece of glass. Both take both the swab and the glass is the question. Does that make sense? Yes, yep. I, I okay. can I can help you with that, Elsa. Okay. Um, bottom line is we're going to go over that um, very question in a, in a future webinar with the collection process. But I'm a firm believer: um, always submit yeah, as best as possible. Always try to submit the entire substrate. Um, obviously, if there's enough blood there and a swab is adequate, well, we'll take the swab. But if I had a small piece of glass. Uh, I would probably be uh, packaging that glass very safely in a cardboard box and sending the entire item to the uh, to the uh, to the lab. And the reason that I say uh, uh, submit the entire substrate is is because if you have quantity insufficient, it is very easy and very helpful for the um, uh, forensic scientists to go back to the original evidence and to re-swab. Uh, that evidence and get the uh, the needed uh, DNA that uh, may be remaining. And always don't think of blood. A lot of times with the touch evidence, uh, a rim of a drinking glass. Uh, many times, if you re-swab it, you will uh, you will recover additional uh, additional skin cells. Okay, here's another one. Um, did the program include hiring any analysts to focus on analyzing DNA evidence on property crimes only? Were these analysts retained after government funding ended? Yes, in our situation, we hired one during the program. Uh, she actually left for another job about the time the money ran out, and that's when we made our pitch to the city for a dedicated analyst. And we believe that based on the volume that we had, that we needed two. We were able to get two and get them trained and validated on our systems. And it's interesting, during the period of time when we weren't running DNA on these cases, there was an actual slight increase in the burglary rate. Once we got back to having two analysts or dedicated analysts, then we started to see the decline again. Uh, and it took time, of course, to train those people. But right now in the Denver Police Crime Lab, we have two dedicated analysts to property crime DNA. Okay. Um... Let's see. Our state lab will not do DNA tests from u urine or fecal matter. Does anyone have this prob problem? How do you overcome it? I don't know if you guys can answer that question or not. We don't I use our state lab. Um, yeah. our, our lab will do that work. Okay. Um, let me see. Got a couple more. I've got like four more minutes here. Um, maybe both of you could talk a little bit about, um, we've got one question about what advice you would give to someone who is interested in starting to use DNA in property crimes but um, maybe can't get leadership on board or just doesn't exactly know where to start what would be sort of the first thing that they should try to do. And you can Joe? maybe start, Joe. And is, that, is that question coming in from a, 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 a crime yeah. lab or law enforcement or? Law enforcement. It's coming in from law enforcement. Number one, I go to my uh, my immediate supervisors. Uh, I'm not sure uh, you know, the chain of command and the um, and the uh, and the amount of personnel you have in your department. But I would strongly recommend that you have to get your supervisors uh, obviously on board. And those supervisors getting back into that teamwork. Um, you, you're going to have to have sit down meetings with not only uh, law enforcement, lab personnel, prosecutor's office. And uh, and go from there. Everyone's going to have to be on board because if one agency doesn't hold their weight, 
it's no sense doing it. It's no sense submitting DNA if it's going on a shelf somewhere never to be analyzed. No sense uh, uh, identifying an offender and no one's going out and locking them up or no one's prosecuting or they're, they're not going away anywhere. So everybody's got to be on board with this. So it starts off with meetings. And the meetings came, uh, my department will never say no to money. So when this grant money first came in, I mentioned to you earlier on, we had 180,000. 180, well, by the end of the program in two years, we were able to uh, uh, get $2 million through grant money and spread it citywide, and we took off from there. Uh, what I'd say is that, obviously, I mean, when we, we went to public meetings when the Wellers were out in Washington Park, pulling all those burglaries, very, very angry citizens, hundreds of them at those meetings. And we were able to announce that we found DNA on a cigarette butt with two different people's DNA on it. We thought that they were responsible for the bulk of those burglaries. The people that are victims of these kind of property crimes, um, they, they never believe they're going to be the victim of a sex assault or a violent crime necessarily, but Almost everybody that comes into our court system as a juror has been the victim of a property crime. So I think that if you talk to your city leaders, the people that fund these kind of programs, I agree with Joe, everybody has to be on board. Uh, and I think that if you have the resources uh, and can start this kind of program going, even without grants, uh, it's something that it's invaluable to helping reduce the property or reduce the crime rate in your city. Okay, we have like about one more minute, maybe two. Um, to probably try one more question, and then we have a bunch that have come in, and we will send out the answers to those questions by email. Um, here's one: uh, Does DNA have higher rates of comparison than fingerprints? I don't know who wants. Either one of you can just jump in. Um, uh, you know the answer. <laughs> well, I, I I'll start it off by. We should never lose uh, sight of the valuable uh, evidence as a fingerprint. Fingerprint is still uh, still our bread and butter. Uh, it's uh, it's more plentiful at a crime scene. It is much much cheaper, and it's a hell of a lot quicker. Uh, so actual stats, DNA is pretty solid evidence. Uh, with the advancements in technology increasing literally uh, from a uh, daily, weekly, monthly um, uh, rate, uh, the chances of someone else having another profile is getting more and more remote. Notice I say uh, uh, remote in that fingerprints obviously is individualistic. DNA, I think now is you can get a, uh, a, 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 a chance of someone having another similar DNA profile is one in the billions. I've, I've never seen the stat on fingerprints, obviously. Fingerprint evidence is is incredibly important in in, bur in burglary prosecutions or any kind of property crime prosecutions. But you know when you have a 50% average hit rate when you're using DNA, I think that uh, we would never not have not use fingerprints or replace fingerprints with this. We just use the two of them together. Okay, it looks like thank you, um, Joe and Mitch. Um, we are out of time. Um, we do have, like I said, a lot of questions that we will send out by email, and um, I want to let everyone know that today's presentation was recorded and will be made um, available online as well as the PowerPoint slides, so you will get an email about uh, where to find those on our website. And also just remember to visit our website to learn about future webinars. Um, you can see on the screen there are some resources here for you, our website, the Denver DA website, dna.gov, and another one, dnaresource.com, which has a really great email um, newsletter that comes out. So you might want to sign up for that. Um, so thanks everyone for listening and we hope to see you on our next webinar.